Um, as we turn our attention to the book of Philippians once again today, in our sermon series, we've, <coughs> excuse me, that we've entitled <coughs> Koinonia, uh, which is, as we've discovered, a word in the Greek that means living in fellowship. Today we're looking at uh, becoming a, a battle-ready fellowship. How do you become a battle-ready fellowship? In many ways, I think it would be strange to us if we were to turn on the, the television to the news channel, or if we were to, as many of us do nowadays, uh, grab our smartphone or tablet or some kind of wireless device and, and, and tap on or click on our our uh, news app and we were to discover there was nothing but good news I mean, wouldn't that be awesome I mean perfect peace perfect tranquility harmony in the world no shootings no murder no war no robbery no theft no abuse no domestic violence uh, you know no pain no armed robberies, no, no hate, no fear. In a word, no evil. I mean, how many of you would like to live in a world like that? Amen. Well, absolutely, we all would. And as much as we would love to live in a world like that, in fact, as much as we look forward to the day when, when Christ Jesus comes again, in all of His power, in all of His glory, to establish His, his great kingdom on this, on this earth with a, with a new heavens and a new earth. Where all of that is going to take place. As much as we would love to have that right here and now, it's not reality for us in this present time. The reality is there is evil. And there is suffering. And there is hurt. And there is discouragement. And there is fear. And there's a world that's been ravaged by an enemy. The enemy of our soul. The enemy of our God. And Satan has had his way. We live in a world in conflict. And in the midst of, of all of that, we're, we're called to be something different. We're, we're called to be the righteous. We're, we're called to be the ones who show what it means to live in peace and harmony and unity and all the things that we hope and long for. The world ought to look at us and See something different than what it sees all around us. I want to see something different, but not a, a repulsive different. A different that's an attractive different. A different that creates a desire to, to have whatever it is that we have that gives us this peace and, and a contentment in, in our lives and our souls that makes us different from the, the evil in the world around us. Remember how Jesus prayed for His disciples in our study of John in chapter 17? And, and He prayed for those of us who would, who would believe Generations later, down the line, now here we are. Jesus had prayed for us, just as He did those disciples there in John 17. you remember His prayer? He said, I give them Your Word. I've given them Your Word, and the world has hated them because they are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. I do not ask you to take them out of the world, but that you keep them from the evil one. They are not 
of the world, just as I am not of the world. Sanctify them in truth. Your word is truth. And because Jesus prayed these words, we are said to be a people in the world, but not of the world. You've heard that before. We're people in this world, but our, our citizenship is elsewhere. Amen. We're citizens of a, a different kingdom, God's heavenly kingdom. It was also a consistent theme in, in Paul's letters to the churches. Remember, inspired by the Holy Spirit of God, he, he wrote to encourage them in their daily walk. Which is another way of saying their, their daily lives. How, how they would live each day according to their citizenship in heaven and not in this world. Because the world is looking, the world is watching our walk, watching our lives, looking for that hope and that peace that we proclaim, we preach. But the question is, do we practice what we preach to the believers over in Ephesus, Paul writes, chapter 4, verse 1, I therefore, a prisoner for the Lord, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you've been called. To the believers over in Colossae, Paul writes in chapter 1, verse 10, walk in a manner worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing to Him, bearing fruit in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God. To the believers over in Thessalonica, Paul writes in chapter 2, verse 12, 1 Thessalonians, we exhort each one of you and encourage you and charge you to walk in a manner worthy of God who calls you into His own kingdom and glory. Do you notice a pattern here? Is it any wonder that to the believers in Philippi, Paul would write in verse 27, chapter 1 we read a few moments ago, only let your manner of life, your walk, be worthy of the gospel of Christ so that whether I come and see you or am absent, I may hear of you that you are standing firm in one spirit with one mind striving side by side for the faith of the gospel. Back in the day, in the days when translations were being made of, of the Greek New Testament. And in 1611, when the King James Version, for example, was, was translated, you find an interesting word there in verse 27. The translators use the word conversation. Let your conversation be such as, you know, is, is pleasing to the Lord. In that day, in that time, did you know that the, this word conversation had more to do with how you lived your life than what you said from your mouth? And that word has, has come to have a different meaning today. When we talk about conversation, it has to do with our words. But in, in generations past, that word conversation meant how you live your life. Some translations that uh, modern translations use the word conduct. The Greek, they're translating this, this phrase, conduct yourselves in a manner that's worthy of the gospel. 
of Christ. In the original text, the Greek here actually uses a, a verb form of the word from which we get our word politics. In fact, the, uh, the New Living Translation aptly translates this text this way. Above all, you must live as citizens of heaven, conducting yourselves in a manner worthy of the good news about Christ. The citizenship that we, that we have in heaven should have an impact on our lives and our lives ought to impact the world in which we live. We know that, that the world is not our final resting place. We know that our, our citizenship is, is in heaven as believers in Jesus Christ. And we, we long for that day when, when we'll see Him face to face and, and we'll be there with Him and He with us. Yet we live in this present reality nonetheless. So for your outline, I want to give you number point number one. And that's simply to say this. Though our lives are often affected by the conflict of this world, This fallen world ought to be affected by our conduct, by our lives. Do you see the difference? So often we let the world around us, the conflict that is out there, affect us. Amen. But the truth of the gospel is that God has taken us and planted us in places and positions of, of influence in our families, in, in our place of work, our business, our school, wherever He's placed us so that we would have an effect on the fallen world around us more so than it having an effect on us. Paul wanted these believers in Philippi to remember that we are engaged in spiritual warfare. And our job is to represent this good news, this gospel of, of our Lord, our King, Jesus Christ. To the Corinthians, Paul used the analogy of being an ambassador. You may remember 2 Corinthians chapter 5 where we're, we're called to be royal ambassadors for God. But here... The emphasis is more on being that of a soldier in God's kingdom. How is it that our lives are to affect the world around us for the cause of Christ? Well, I'm glad you asked. You know, there's a number of ways that, that we can do that, but certainly Paul gives us some clues here, and we want to we want to open that up a little bit and explore these three things. Paul mentions three things here that are certainly ways that we can have an effect on the world around us as opposed to being affected by it. The very first thing that he mentions is to stand firm. Look back at verse 27 again. It says, you know, let your manner of life, your, your citizenship, how you live, how you walk, be a life that's worthy of the gospel of Christ. And then he says, so whether I, I, I come to you or whether I'm, I'm absent, either way, I want to find that you're standing firm in one spirit. Stand firm in spiritual unity. The first of our, our three examples, stand firm in spiritual unity. Paul uses a military word here. It's a word that means hold your ground. Don't give up. Don't give an inch. During our, our vacation 
this last week. We had some time to get away for a few days. We were down at the Gulf, and you know, we've had a lot of rain. Um, on those rainy days, you know, it's not so nice to, to be out on the beach. But it was, it was nice to kind of hang out and relax a little bit. And uh, it just so happened that um, in our condo, um, our friends that, that owned the condo had left uh, uh, several uh, DVDs, which is always convenient when it's a rainy day, you know, pop in a movie and, and kind of chill and relax. The boys noticed that they had the, the full trilogy of the Lord of the Rings. So guess what I got to do this week? I got to watch every episode or the full trilogy of the Lord of the Rings. And of course, there's, there's all these battles that are happening in uh, J.R.R.R.R.R. How many R's there are? Tolkien's, you know, books. Or the <coughs> trilogy. There's always this conflict. There's always this battle. There's, there's good versus evil and and there's always that climactic moment when the forces of good are just outnumbered. There's absolutely no way that this small band of warriors is going to defeat this, this vast army that not only is marching uh, on them, but has literally surrounded them. And, and they're in this little circle. And, and you're, you're sitting on the edge of your seat and you're hoping that something good is going to happen here. Somehow, some way, good is going to win. And of course, you know, if you've seen the movies, you've read the, the, the books, you know that, that good triumphs. Evil is defeated. But it's never, ever defeated when the warriors give up and go home. It's never defeated when, when they just give away the territory and say, you know what, we're done. Paul is using the same kind of analogy here. He's saying, in your life, there's going to be evil. There's going to be suffering. There's going to be difficulty. But in the midst of all of that, stand your ground. Stand on the Word of God. It will never fail. In fact, it's the one thing that is going to, to survive everything else uh, that's in this world other than you know, those, those of us who, who follow Christ and love Him and, 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 and are, are uh, part of the kingdom. What does Jesus say about His Word? My Word will stand forever. So stand firm on it. Don't give up. Don't give in. That is Paul's admonition, his encouragement to the believers there in Philippi with the struggles that they're facing. If you want to have an effect on the world around you, just stand firm in what you believe. You may get some opposition, but people take note of that. But you know, there's something else that Paul mentions here. He says not only to, to stand firm in, in spiritual unity, but he also says to, to strive together in single-mindedness. He says striving side by side for the faith of the gospel. Strive together in single-mindedness. Now, while standing firm had a military tone, this word that Paul is using here for striving actually in ancient times had a, a, an athletic tone to it. When athletes take the field, what is the expectation? Really? Nothing? Where? There you go! Thank you! When you take the field, the expectation is that you and your 
your team is going to win the day. When the buzzer goes off, when, when the time ticks down, the scoreboard is going to have your team as the winner and the opposition as the loser. And, and that's the same concept that, that Paul was thinking of here now, as the Holy Spirit gave him this word in the Greek language that has to do with athletics. He says, strive together. Be a team. Play like a team. Be unified as a team. Do this together and make it to the goal. Be successful in the task that you've been given. Well, what, what is the goal? What's the prize? What is the win? How do we know when we won the game? Well, what happens when, when uh, your team scores, when, when good things happen um, and, and your team scores? Or, um, you know, what, what generally happens in the stands, in the crowd? People are cheering. Now, I want to ask you another question. What happens in heaven when a lost sinner comes to Christ? The angels in heaven even rejoice, Scripture says. They're throwing a big party. They're here. I just, you just see the pom-poms going. I mean, they're just awesome. Another win. Another win. Another victory. That's what we're striving for. That's what we're pushing for. That's why we have vacation Bible schools and we, we teach our children the gospel, the good news of Jesus, that He loves them. He died on the cross for their sins. And he rose again from the grave. That he's ascended to heaven. He's coming again. And all you've got to do is just trust him. Give him your life. Give him your heart. Believe in him. He's the son of God. He's the, the, the king of kings, lord of lords. He's going to win the, the ultimate battle one day. But just trust him. Give him your heart. And when boys and girls do that at vacation Bible school, we all rejoice. And we've got the pom-poms going you know, in our hearts. But in heaven, in heaven they're rejoicing. That's what it looks like to win in God's kingdom. And that's what Paul is encouraging these believers in Philippi to, to, to push for, to strive for, to strive together. Now, what often happens in churches and church life? The enemy it, it is out there in, in terms of you know, Satan and, and the opposition to the gospel. But so often, we're, we're, we struggle with, with internal conflict. That is not what Paul is, is suggesting here. Say, look, you take it to the enemy. Don't let the enemy bring his conflict into your house and disrupt things. When we get over into to chapter 4, we're going to see uh, some disunity, some disharmony, or chapter 3. And, and for some disharmony that had crept in the, the church there in Philippi. But Paul's encouragement here is he's saying, look, if you want to have a, an effect, an impact on the world out there, you've got to stand firm in the gospel. You've got to be unified in that spiritually, doctrinally. And you've got to strive together like an athletes going into, going into the game to win, to win the day, to win the game. To win lost souls for Jesus Christ. And there's one last thing about this. Paul says, you know how you do all that? You do all that fearlessly. Stay fearless in the face of adversity. Look at verse 30. I'm sorry. Uh, verse 28. And not frightened in anything... By your opponents. So there's number three. Stand firm. Like a, a mighty army. A standing its ground in battle. Strive together. Like a well old machine. A, a, an athletic program. That's, that's moving forward. And winning. Souls for Christ. And stay fearless. In the face of of adversity. The word here that Paul uses kind of goes back to the battle issue. 
Sometimes in battle, there are there are horsemen. Uh, there's the cavalry that, that's called to to uh, to go ahead and, and break the lines of the enemy, and then then the foot soldiers would, would come in behind. Occasionally, one of the horses that these cavalry members were riding would be spooked. A cannon fire, a gunshot, something would spook the horse. And rather than running into battle where, where the horse is, is, has been trained to go, the horse does the exact opposite and, and runs the other way. That's the word that, that Paul is using here that in ancient times would describe that horse. That horse got spooked. It became fearful and ran away from the battle rather than running into the battle. And so Paul says, don't be like that horse. Don't be uh, fearful in the face of your adversary. Look, we've got the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords on our side. Who should we fear? If God is for us, who can be against us? We can look at all kinds of scripture that would help us remember that, that we're to be fearless. You remember Joshua and the conquest of, of the promised land there in, in chapter 1 of, of that great book in the Old Testament when three times God encourages Joshua in the face of the enemy that's before him, be strong and courageous. But what's the opposite of that? Fearful. In other words, God is saying, be fearless. Be courageous. And why did God say that Joshua could be fearless and courageous? Because he had God on his side. He said, I am with you. You don't fight this battle alone. I am with you. In fact, about 40 years before that, in the book of Exodus, the nation had come right up to the edge of the promised land, and, and God said, okay, Moses, go ahead and, and lead the people on in to, to take the promised land. They decided to send in spies and Kind of check things out. We know the rest of the story. The spies come back and, and, and uh, 10 of the 12 say, there's no way we can take this land. It's filled with giants. Two of those spies, Joshua and Caleb, they say, yes, the land is full of giants. It's a great land. It's a land flowing with milk and honey. Let's go take it. We've got God on our side. But the people refused. They followed the majority report. They said, no, we're, we're not going to go. We're not going to, to take this land. Even though God had, had commanded them to, to go ahead and and, and do it, to, to go ahead and take possession. They knew it would, would take a fight. They knew it would be a, a battle. They feared the giants in the land. They feared the potential conflict they would face. And they forfeited the blessing of God for 40 years. Go ahead and give you number two for your outline. We don't want to be like that. So for us, our Christ-like conduct in the face of conflict proves both His saving work in our lives and the condemnation of the unbelieving world. Look again at verse 28. He says, so, 
So don't be afraid, not frightened by anything, by your opponents. And then he says, this is a clear sign to them of their destruction, but of your salvation, and that from God. See, when, even when it would be much easier to cut a corner, to exaggerate the numbers, to defudge the math, to misrepresent the truth, to, to falsify, to cheat, to, to do something that would be in our best interest to help us get ahead. <coughs> when all of that is, it is easier to do than, than to do the right thing, what are we called to do? To do the right thing. Our Christ-like conduct <clears throat> is testimony to the world that following Jesus is the right way. It's the, it's the only way. It's the way that, that brings His holiness and, and His righteousness into our lives. Are we perfect products yet? No. At least I'm not. Pretty sure you haven't made it there either. But we're a work in progress. And the world ought to see in us that God is doing something even in the midst of a conflict, even in the midst of the struggle. God is doing a work in our lives, a, a sanctifying work in us through the Holy Spirit, changing, renewing, remaking our lives. And when they see that in us, that's something attractive. That's something that the world wants to have in their lives and, and so often they don't know how to get it or where to go to get it. And Paul is saying that there should be such a conspicuous difference, a, a bright, shining difference in our lives than in the world. One of the reasons they hated Jesus was because of the, the light of His purity exposed the darkness of sin. And so sometimes as much as we want to be attractive, there are those who are repulsed. There are those who would rather live in, in the darkness than, than to turn to the light of Christ. There are those that would rather put out the light, smash the light bulb, hurt us in hopes that our lights won't be so bright. Paul dealt with that resistance, that, that suffering that he knew was happening in, in the lives of those believers in Philippi, just as it was in his own life. Paul says there are three important benefits of being a follower of Jesus. I want to give you these three real quick in closing. In verse 29 he says, For it has been granted to you, that's, that's like saying, you've been given a gift. Let me tell you about that gift. It's been granted to you for the sake of, the, of Christ, that you should not only believe in Him, but also suffer for His sake, engage in the same conflict that you saw I had, and now here that I still have. Three benefits that we enjoy of being believers and followers of Jesus that the world ought to see in us. One benefit is the benefit of faith. The benefit of faith. 
Paul says you've been given this gift. You've been granted faith. You've been granted to believe. It's a gift from God to believe. Ephesians 2, 8, For by grace you've been saved through faith. It's not of yourselves. It's not of your own doing. It's a gift of God. That's a pretty good benefit. Being a, a Christian to believe, to have faith, to have this trust in Jesus, that no matter what, He's going to see us through. But there's another benefit that, that Paul mentions here that, that kind of sounds a little strange to us. It's the benefit of suffering. In verse 29, again he said, not only have you been granted to believe, but also to suffer for his sake. How in the world is it a benefit to the believer to suffer? <laughs> Paul spells this out a little bit in Romans chapter 5. He's speaking of Jesus, he says, through him. We have also obtained access by faith into this grace in which we stand. And we rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. More than that, we rejoice in our suffering. Knowing that suffering produces endurance. And endurance produces character. And character produces hope. And hope does not put us to shame because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who's been given to us. So suffering has a is a benefit, is a is a blessing to the believer because it shows the fact that, that we're still a work in progress. And sometimes in order to become all that God wants to do to, to do and to be, we have to pass through His refining fire. That's not always pleasant. So, just as we learned back in, in verse 12, Paul talked about being in prison, and yet it, it turned out to his benefit because he was able to be a witness to the guards. He was winning people to Christ right there in, in his prison cell. So in the same way, we have this opportunity to view our suffering as a sign that, that God's still at work in us. Producing in us His character and hope so that we can show the world what a great God He is. There's one last benefit, and that's the benefit of fellowship. Verse 30, Paul talks about the fact that he was engaged in the same conflict. That's a way of saying that, that we're all in this together. You're not in this alone. Whatever suffering you're, you think you're going through, you're not alone in this. That's where the body of Christ comes in. We, we rejoice when others rejoice, but we suffer. We hurt when, when other parts of the body suffer and hurt. It's like Paul is saying to those believers, I'm right there with you, right in the middle of this. Remember, I'm praying for you. That's the whole first 12 verses of, of, this, uh, of this chapter. His prayer for them. We're in this together. We're here to fellowship together. In the good times, in the bad times, in faith, in suffering, and in fellowship, the world ought to see there's a better way. God working in us shows the, the light to the world that we're 
We're in the world, but we're not of it. I'm going to ask you to bow your heads with me for just a moment.